This the, you normally, Vinny, you're you're one of my smarter friends, but in this instance, you're fantastically dumb. Well, I, I I've never doubt I've never denied the fact that I'm prone to moments of pure complete idiocy. But yeah, I don't know how dog muscles work. You realize all mammals are largely. Yeah, but if you look at a dog's legs, they don't they they're reverse articulated. So there's still got to be a muscle there. So the hamstring's is in the front of the leg. It's in the back. Still got to bend that way. A dog's leg yeah, is bends, still going to bend like this. Yeah, but it bends the other way, though. Like this. That's the hamstring that pulls it that way. Okay. Here's a visual everybody can't see. All right, enough about Super China Buffet Day. I just got to conclude by saying a fine time was had by all. Thanks very much to everybody that showed up. The streak continues. We've still not met anybody who showed up that was an asshole. That's always nice. So, yeah, that was the story there. And let's talk a little bit about SummerSlam, and then we'll... Get rid of old Vince here and get a real guest on the line, that being Indeed. Dave, who I believe liked the show slightly more than I did. I thought this was a really good show. I I thought the last two matches were great. I don't necessarily think the last match was the best WWE match of the year. I don't even know if I would consider it the best of the Edge Undertaker matches. I don't think it was the best match in the show, necessarily. You thought Dave and Batista was better? Dave and Batista was pretty damn great. It was pretty damn great, but but so was the main event. I I can't fault either match. Yeah. I think I gave I think I gave Dave and Batista three and three quarter, and I think they gave the main event four. But it's all subjective, or as M Rob would say, it's all objective. But um, let's run down the show. Let's so open up with Jeff Hardy and MVP. Jeff supposedly had a broken neck. Apparently not. He got better. Got micro braids though that looked awesome. That's next for my hair, by the way. For those of you keeping track, including Doc Young, who's growing his hair exactly like mine. Apparently, this is his life goal. Micro braids are next, Doc. So, anyway, they had a, a final match right here. MVP worked over his back and that sort of thing. And, and then they did a bunch of, of near falls at the finish. Jeff hit the whisper in the wind and went up top for the senton. But Shelton ran out. And Jeff wiped him out with a dive and then rushed up top to the senton. But MVP moved. And then after he crashed and burned MVP, hitting his shining Yakuza kick for the pin. And the story the announcers were trying to tell was that Jeff was reckless, and it was unfortunate, and it cost him the match. And I gave it three stars. It was a very good opener. Uh, my favorite thing about it was just how simple it was. They did not do eight million near falls. In fact, I don't think they really did any major ones. There, no one kicked out of any finishes or anything. They just did their stuff, and MVP, or, yeah, MVP got the heat, and Jeff made his comeback, and... Hit the big dive on Shelton, missed the sent on, ate the boot, and got pinned. Easy to remember. And it's, it's three or four hours later, and I didn't have to look at my nose for any of that. Then we had Maria doing an interview, and up walked Santino and Beth. And Santino said Maria had let herself go since they broke up, and he was currently dating a fine new woman. And Maria brought up his unibrow, and he said he grew it out because the Glamazon loved it. And then he said, but enough about my manscaping! This is the best man there's ever been. <laughs> He's awfully great. Manscaping. How could I have never thought of that before? Actually, I know you've heard it before because I know Craig said it once and you've laughed. You laughed at really? exactly the same. It's always new to you, but yes. Wow. Now, nah, Craig couldn't quite possibly be that witty. I will say that Santino is so other than Craig. <laughs> he, in fact, is. And I apologize, Craig. Which led to Mickey James and Kofi against Beth Phoenix and Santino. And it was a, it was a fine little match. I gave it two and a half stars. The highlight was Santino's commentary during the match, and Mickey ended up hitting Santino with her DDT, but then the Glamazon clonked Mickey from behind and hit the implant buster for the pin, and and uh, there's a lesson to be learned from this match, and this is what it is. Everybody knew what was going to happen. Everybody knew that Beth Phoenix was going to win the championship for her man. They still did it, and it was still fucking great. Yes. If they would have, if they would have had, say, Kofi Kingston pin Beth or pin uh, pin Santino, and the champions retain their titles, I would have been like, "Wow, that was shocking." I guess, but I would not have enjoyed it at all, and I would have been mad. I do not want to be surprised when there are better options, even if we know what the options are. So I knew what was going to happen here, and I'm glad it happened. I'm ecstatic it happened. This team so deserves to win, but. As, as you put it, not only did, San, uh, did, did Beth win the title for her man, as the announcers noted, he was virtually unconscious because he was selling the DDT out cold. Beth had to revive him, hand him his belt, and he was still confused. And when he finally realized what had happened, he began to French kiss the belt. He had a great celebration, although those in the, the proper household were disappointed. He did not play his air trombone again, but he was very, very happy. He had declared that he did it all by himself. 
Beth, of course, won her belt, and all was right with the world. And as noted, the, the highlight Actually, was... Actually, he held both belts. He felt oh, he had they, won they, they both the, championships. Yes, yeah, so that, I, was, I was thinking of the top of the ramp, but before that, Santino stood on the apron with both belts. Beth stood on the floor, and he climbed on her shoulders, and she paraded him around holding both belts in the air. Yes. It was the best thing I ever saw in my life. Is she... I mean, let's break it down. She's the man in this relationship, yep. and he's the woman. Indeed. Actually, that, that probably even sounds sexist based on how they portray this. But, um, yes, this ruled. It is all great. The, the, the highlight of the match was uh, Kofi faking a dive and doing that thing where he hits the rope with his neck and bounces back. Santino's response to this fake dive was to shriek like a girl, who had, a, a girl in the 50s who had seen a mouse and leap into the arms of his savior, Beth. Yes. His protector. Fabulous. This is all great entertainment. So then Sean came out with his wife, and this woman deserves an award. She was so awesome. It from beginning to end, actually. She was awesome. He was awesome. And Chris Jericho was awesome. Chris I, Jericho's suit was also awesome. I, I cannot do this justice, but to cut to the chase, Sean came out and announced that his eye had gotten worse, and combined with the back and knee injuries, he was retiring. And he talked about his career and the things that he had done. And and when he first said he was retiring, people actually screamed, no, and booed. It got better. And he continued saying it was not going to be unpopular, blah, blah, blah. And finally, out came Jericho. And the look on Rebecca's face when his music hit was golden. And he came out in his fat suit. And he basically said, I will not allow you to leave in this fashion. I want you to stand right here and tell the world that you are not leaving on your own terms. You are leaving because I fucked up your eye, and I ended your career. Yes, and he, he wanted to make it clear that Sean's legacy would be that Chris Jericho ended his career. Yes. The WrestleManias are out. DX is out. None of that matters. All that matters is that Jericho ended it. That was his point. So Sean said, fine, I will admit it, but what I want you to do is I want you to go home, and I want you to look your wife and your children in the eye, and you tell them that your daddy will never, ever be Shawn Michaels. And they had a long stare down. Shawn turned to leave. Jericho grabbed him and threw a punch. Shawn dodged it. And Chris Jericho punched Shawn Michaels' wife, Rebecca, right in the face, and he hit her hard, and down she went. And Sean began to lose his mind in the ring as Jericho slowly left and inched his way back up the ramp. And as noted, I can't do this justice, but I will just say that I would have rather he pulled the punch. But at least she got punched for the best fucking angle of the year. Yeah. This was a WrestleMania hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of thousands of buys angle. And... Unfortunately, we're going to see it in September. <laughs> but oh, God perfect. damn, this was motherfucking great. It was so perfect. And frankly, if you're going to potato a girl with a punch, it, this was the perfect punch to do it with. She got a fat lip. Yeah. That sucks, but he didn't. I mean, it's not a broken jaw. It's not a chipped tooth. It's not a missing tooth. The swelling will go down in a few days, and she will be fine. It was really a, If he threw this punch a thousand times, it would never be this perfect. Uh, unless he just pulled it, which would be better. But... Yeah, and again, we can't do justice to the angle, but Sean, Sean was so perfect and so believable. Rebecca, his wife, actually, a single tear did, in fact, roll down her cheek at one point yes. as her husband stood there. A single tear. This, I swear to Christ, I'm not exaggerating. That happened. And Sean was believable as he said. He sounded like a guy who was just accepting the fact his career was done. As he noted, it had been 20 long years. He had done everything. He had formed DX. He listed the good and the bad. He formed DX. He was Mr. WrestleMania. He was the icon, the showstopper, the main event. He had all the world titles, all the awards. At the same time, he was the guy who retired Ric Flair. He was the guy who screwed Bret Hart. He was the guy who even lost his smile. And it was like a perfect speech. And looking, Here's a full confession. Here's everything I've done, the, the ups, the downs, the goods, the bads. And it's coming to a close, and I'm okay with that. And then Jericho, Jericho came out to just be the ultimate prick. Just to, to take to, to steal Sean's final glory was what, was what we wanted to do. And when Sean wouldn't give him that, he, of course, got violent. And, and it happened, and it was great. And pe people, before even before Jericho came out, when I said, I, I mentioned, you mentioned the people were screaming and booing when he said he would retire. It got better. As he got into his speech, they found people who were crying. Yeah. Crying. 
Yes. <laughs> Crying. So moved by the retirement of Shawn Michaels here. He's a heartbreak kid. Here halfway through SummerSlam. He broke hearts. Yeah, well, he, yes, he did. He broke several in this building. And, and it was so, it was kind of funny because people so believed the retirement that when Jericho's music hit, it was a huge cheer. Because I think they all figured out, yay, Shawn's not really retiring. Yeah. It was th- This segment was so fucking awesome from beginning to end. This was the best angle of the year. I don't care what anybody says. Then we had the worst thing on the show. Mark Henry and Matt Hardy went like 30 seconds. Matt immediately hit the twist of fate. Tony Atlas pulled him out of the ring for the DQ. Yes, a DQ in a match for the ECW title via pull out of the ring. So Atlas went after Matt afterwards. Jeff Hardy made the save, squashed Atlas with a dive, and then they gave Henry a double suplex on the floor and left him laying. And I was going to give this minus one star because this was offensive to the ticket-buying public. But when I saw Tony Atlas selling his abdomen on the way to the back, I gave it one star. That wow, was that fucking, selling was worth two stars for you. It was. Tony it was Atlas's great. selling was so over-the-top hilarious that I got to give this one star. It, it was amazing that after all of these weeks of they dedicated one hour a week on Sci-Fi, basically, to building up Matt Hardy versus Mark Henry, and we said... No one wants to see this, but they've done a great job of building it up. I said they've done everything they can to build up a match yes. that nobody's going to pay to see. If there was one person, even one person, who was convinced to buy SummerSlam because of this match, they got ripped off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. My other favorite part here, briefly, as we mentioned, it went 30 seconds. The first words out of Matt Stryker's mouth after the bell rang were, Matt Hardy in the in the black and gold pants, Mark Henry in the black singlet. Yes. Or Mark Henry in the black singlet. Thank you. There was no other way to discern which man was which. I yeah. was confused. And we had CM Punk against JBL for the world title. JBL's dropped some weight. I gave this match two and three quarter stars. It was it was pretty good. There was some problems there to finish. The big spot was Punk went for a flying kick, and he landed and JBL landed, and the back of their heads clonked together. And Punk was face down, so his knee also smashed into the mat. Or his nose, sorry. And JBL, in hitting the back of his head on Punk's skull, looked like he was not batty. That's exactly what I was going to use. And they went a little longer. JBL put him on the top rope, hit him with like six of the hardest fucking forearms you've ever seen in the back, gave him a back suplex off, and then Punk almost immediately hoisted him up for the GTS and pinned him. And I I don't know if they went home early because of, of uh, the head bonking, but uh, the finish came out of nowhere. And, you know, JBL was clearly not happy with one Mr. Punk. Indeed. And <laughs> right after it happened, you mentioned that he was due for a hit. For a, for a hit. Oh, excuse me, that was early in the match. After There was a miscommunication spot where Punk... Uh, I don't J- know what happened. JBL threw a forearm, but as he threw it, Punk went to hit the ropes. Yeah. And they bonked into each other, and you said, Punk is about to get hit hard. <laughs> and actually, it didn't really happen. JBL no. just began to stretch his abdominals. Yeah, he did. And... That was not Punk. as good as Tony Atlas's, but... No, no, no. That, and that, that was Punk's strike one. And and strike two was this leg lariat or flying kick, whichever it was. And, yeah, he, he, it, JBL looked like he got knocked bad. He, Punk was bleeding profusely from the back of the head. Bad. It was it was bad times for all involved. And and just JBL sitting Punk on the top rope and wailing away on him was... I, I, I'm sorry. Kind of, I'm, maybe I'm I'm guilty of something here, but that made me laugh. I laughed too. I laughed too, and and then, and then Punk won, and then the fans liked it. And he didn't hurt him; he just hit him in the back. Yeah, exactly. He's fine. And and, and they were both hit more by the head spot than by these forearms. So Punk always knew up hit the GTS. People loved him. So it, it was just like six shots. Like he was going, "Watch where you fucking land, geek." Yes. <laughs> he may have been yelling that for all I know. Hopefully he was. But uh, yeah, and it it long term didn't damage either guy. I, I'm sure they'll both be okay. And. It was your, your rating says about right. This match was fine for a pay per view. You know, the World Championship is a mid card match, but it was fine for a pay per view mid card match. Triple H versus Kali for the World Title. I gave it star and a half. It wasn't horrible. It was not all that good. There was some embarrassingly bad stuff. There were loud and frequent chants of "You can't wrestle." There were a lot of nerve holds. The story was: Can Hunter Pedigree Great Kali? He tried three times and finally got it on the third. And that was the extent of that. So, um, yeah. There's not a whole hell of a lot else to say. They did at one point have one of the worst brawls of the year. 
The only brawl worse may have been their own brawl on SmackDown two days prior. That was also horrible, but uh, <laughs> I, I did like Kali getting tied up on the ropes, hitting a boot, and then apparently I think he was legit stuck because he was looking at the ref and shouting, and the ref had to come over and hork him out of there. But other than that, they... they, they I love they, that spot, by the way. When a giant man gets wrapped up in the ropes... And you charge at this helpless man, and he still p- kicks you in the face and beats you up. Right. God, what a fucking dumb baby face. Indeed. But it, 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 it went like 10 minutes with the Great Collie, somewhere in that range, and it did not totally suck. So that's really the best you can hope for. Cena and Batista gave three and three-quarter stars. I think that this could have been a four-and-a-quarter star match if they'd gotten more time. It seemed rushed. It seemed like it, it, it should very have been, early they were doing Jack Hammers and Fisherman suplexes. This should have been a like a twenty or a twenty two minute match and I bet they got about fourteen or fifteen total. I think they just they cut out the first part of the match and got right to the meat of things and what they did was great. I just think it could have, have built better and anyway, they did all sorts of scary spots and, and uh hit kicked out of their finishers at the finish. And fans were more into Batista than Cena. A lot of they did the boo and yay spot on the punches, and they were booing Cena and cheering Dave. And uh, the finish, the big finish, was Cena going for something off the top, and he got power bombed in midair for a great near fall. And then Batista just got up, looked mean, booted him in the face, hit a second power bomb, got the clean pin. A really great match. And I, I presume this leads to a second match, which Cena wins. And then of course the rubber match can take place at WrestleMania. But uh, all of this stuff was was very very good. Yeah, it did occur to me that you know we've talked about how they are basically wasting this match on SummerSlam when it could be a main a main event, and not only was it wasted on SummerSlam, but it was the semi main. <laughs> it was not even the main event on the show. Which well, it's, it, this could they have been were not following the hell in the cell. It, but that, I'm sure that's true, but it, they, it just should not have been booked for the show at all. Is my point. That being said, they did book it. It well, was technically, really this is the well third biggest pay per view of the year. I, I I won't count Royal Rumble since yeah. that's a gimmick pay per view, but I mean, as far as just straight match big pay per views, this is the second biggest one of the year. So better here than uh, you know. I, I would rather summer, semi main event SummerSlam than main event at like September show. Okay, I, I, that's fine. Um, what the hell's we gonna say? <laughs> that. that. That totally threw me off because it seems like the, it seems like this match as the main event of September show would boost the September show by a great degree. It would, but it's still it's it's I don't know maybe Cena and Batista is a big enough match that it should headline the big pay per view of the summer. I mean it's big enough that it might it should theoretically boost a lot of on the fence people that would buy SummerSlam, and I don't necessarily think it would have been. You know, I think it would have boosted September a little bit, but you might as well try and make the big money on the big show. I see. And it's it's uh here you go. So I'll, there you. I'll I'll buy that. So Besides, the, they've got Sean and Jericho for September. They do in fact have Sean and Jericho for September. Which after the angle tonight. <laughs> that is an excellent point. So they they had their match, and I like the fact that people indicate, and by people I'm mostly seeing, speaking of Michael Cole, he seemed to think that Dave Batista was a much stronger man than John Cena, and he has a I guess he's to have a better physique and. Maybe he's can lift more weights in the gym, but John Cena has way more power moves than Batista does. Dave has the, the big Dave bomb, which he has done to giant men like Kane, and he has a spine duster, but Cena has FU'd the big show and Kali Lee and, and Viscera. He's so much stronger. And Michael Cole at one point referred to him as sneaky strong. Sneaky. Like it's deceiving. Like, yeah, you would not think this giant man who is big all the time, all year round would be, you know, powerful. Yet he is, and... He had a, 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 the probably the biggest power spot in this match was when Dave went for, for power slam and Cena landed on his feet in like a reverse DDT, DDT position, and from there hurt Dave up onto her shoulders in the FU position. It was awesome, awesome, oh. awesome, awesome. And the match as a whole, the, the basic reason I liked it more than the main event was because it was more like this was just a wrestling match. There was a lot of smoke and mirrors and, and props used in the main event, and and that just you know I like wrestling. Unlike for example Bubba Ray Dudley, I like wrestling. I also like Cole's line about he was talking about all the custom suits Dave owned, and I was like, "Are men that large with that kind of body normally just grabbing suits off the rack?" You know what I mean? Swing by pennies. Great colleague gets fucking custom everything. Yes. What the hell does that mean? Except that he's fucking big. So anyway, Edge and Undertaker, Hell in the Cell. This cell was enormous, like the biggest cell I've ever seen, and. They uh, they had a great match. They brawled all over the place early. A bunch of, of tables, ladders, and chairs came into play. This was, in fact, a TLC match in a steel cage.
Edge. Yes. Although and at least here, unlike TNA, where Booker just wanted weapons, Edge has been Edge had never been in Hell in a Cell, but he had plenty of experience in TLC. And so he loaded the ring with side area with the weapons he was most comfortable with. So that makes sense. And it was simply a stipulation of a Hell in the Cell. They didn't have to say a Hell in the Cell with, with weapons. weapons. So anyway, they used a bunch of weapons. Uh, Edge did a spear and knocked a entire panel off the cage. And so they began beating the hell out of each other outside for a while. They did a big spot on the announcer's table, got back into the ring, and, and uh, I don't even think there was blood in this match now that I think about it. And did all sorts of near falls and well, they are rated G in the mid-ring, and the finish saw uh, they had two tables set up outside, and, and Edge went for the old school on Taker, but Taker crotched him and then gave him a choke slam off the post through two tables stacked up, and then he threw him in the ring, and proceeded to kill him with all of his own moves. He speared him, he hit him with a video camera, which was the finish to Survivor Series, hit him with a concerto, and then tombstone him to death for the pin. And it was a very poetic finish to a very, very good match. I gave it four stars. Um, and then afterwards, this was like four stars, and she just turned the TV off right there. Yeah. Because the post-match was so wacky. They cut backstage, and La Familia was all clear. 